Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 297 for Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. And welcome to the the gig gab. I almost said the other pod, <laughs> one of the other podcasts I do. I don't know why, Paul. Maybe it's been a focus day. Focus it's day. been a busy week. This is gig gab. For those of you that uh, already knew that, I'm I'm catching up here. I'll I'll get there by the end. I, I'm sure the uh, we're the show of by for and about working musicians. And here in Durham, New Hampshire, as far as I'm aware, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here, absolutely in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. I'm glad one of us is sure about this. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Hey man, we uh we did another thing together. It took a long time this one and I it, I I I I am squarely at fault for dragging our feet on this thing that we did with the Macworld All-Star Band. We did a uh an in situ re- rendition of Take Me to the River and it is out now. Um I I I blame COVID uh it, you know the sort of existential dread for keeping me from wanting to focus on this project. I think it was, it definitely you know what? I, I got to stop you there because you're, yeah. you're totally full of beans, man. It was me. I couldn't get you video, right? I got the yeah. audio in a fairly, you know, fairly, you know, short time, but it, man, it was, I, but could, I, I was tired. I'm tired of streams. I'm tired of, yeah. you know, video projects. I'm just like so uninspired to do these things. A, because everybody and their and their dog is doing them, right. you know, so often there's no novelty to them. Right. B, you know, the original vibe of it was, you know, to contribute to people's misery, you know, while they're sheltered in place and, you know, and we're scared and all those types of things. Right. And try and, you know, make people feel better. That's where that, you know, it all started, at least for me. Same. But boy. Yeah. Well, so it's, we, it seems we, we share in this. I, I definitely dragged my feet. I mean, weeks would go by where the ball was <laughs> squarely in my court and I did nothing with it, you know, and thankfully Wally who produced the video. He is like, we, we did the same thing we did with essentially with, uh, when we did feeling all right back in, in the spring, maybe it was summer, uh, where we all recorded ourselves audio and video, uh, at our, at our homes, uh, and then, ship the audio uh, to me and Skylar and I mixed that together. My daughter and I mixed it together and then shipped the video to Wally and he mixed all that together and then, you know, put it together and, you know, slam dunk. Uh, but there were thankfully, and Wally did an, you know, an Excellent. amazing job again as, as expected, but really, really knocked it out of the park with this one. Uh, but thankfully he was the one that would, you know, shoot me emails occasionally like, Hey, how are we doing? I got some time. Would love to do it, you know. And it was like, oh yeah, uh, but th- yeah, that that like you said that that I, I was just experiencing. It was my way of experiencing COVID dread was was sort of ignoring this project when I when I shouldn't because every time I finally sat down to like dig in, I was I was super happy with it. Like it was like, oh, it came out. To be quite honest, this came out so much better than I expected it would once we were about a week and a half into it. Like it, Ah. it was a, it was, it was a, it's a song we never played live as a band. So we never figured out our own arrangement of it. Right. This was something that we only have ever played separately in our homes, at least as this band. And we may have all played it, you know, in, in different projects, in different arrangements, but this particular thing was not something we ever worked out. And so it and it was. It, I'm not sure it's a song that we ever would have worked out, especially not this way. So it, it definitely challenged uh, us, you know, in general, and certainly me in in particular. And so it was. Um, it was. It was. You know that that initial sort of like, oh, this isn't just going to be like butter, like you know. Mm. <laughs> I think that sort of informed it. But I, like I said, now I'm totally blown away with how well it came out. Um, well, I, I would just add two things about this. One is, 
um, it is a triumph of production. So you did a great job, you and Skylar and, you know, your daughter is just awesome because I understand she actually produced you and your parts as well. Right. Absolutely. So not just, Oh yeah. yeah. So hat <laughs> and I was not that. an easy subject, especially <laughs> for this one. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, but a I little, will agree with you. The song is, um, uh, it's a, cha- you know, it's a challenge. It's a soul song yeah. and you know, we're not a soul band and, um, uh, I know I was having a hard time finding my way through it and, and, but the, the final product is so much better than what it felt like in the early renditions of it. You know, the early yeah. audios that you would send around. So a triumph of production, but you know, here's a good lesson. We have to all point our, our, all, everyone in the band has to point our way towards Canada and bow down because, and this is, this is actually a good message for everybody listening because Having a videographer, someone with with at least decent and the better the better yeah. video chops is an essential skill for marketing a band now. Yeah. Sending around an MP3, you're, you you can do it right, but it's not gonna be, you're not gonna get a gig you know over a band that sends a decent video. And so, video is part and parcel of the way that you communicate your band's value now. Um, and it's so essential. Wally, who is amazing, you know, to begin with, this is not a, this is not a, an yeah, amateur guy. This Wally is, is not an amateur. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I gotta, you know, bow down to Wally and thank him for putting together mix. It looks so polished. I mean, just everything, you know, the color matching and the, you know, the, the effects and the, everything like that. It's just beautiful. And it is actually turned out to be something I'm, I'm much more excited about in the final product than, than I was until about, about 95% of the way in, I was yeah. like, I don't think this is the right song for us. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, there was a lot of that. I think we all experienced it in different ways. I will say this. One of my favorite things, like, you know, as I would get back into the tune, of course, you know, I'd sit down to mix it or do something and I'd listen through. And I would get to the second verse. And every time that's where I would just I couldn't help but smile because your guitar groove hits my little upstrokes on the hi-hat, like the little open hi-hat perfectly. I mean, mm. that is like butter. That groove there in that second verse between your guitar and my hi-hat is like, oh man, it's like, it's mm. friggin' perfect. So that, Serendipity. yeah, but it was like, you helped me get through, you know, and get back into it each and every time I, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, but this needs to see the light of day. Like, like this is great. And like, I guess that's what it is. Like sometimes the song you have to, you, you know, we always use honky tonk woman as an example of something you can do anything to and people will like it. Yes. But some songs are worth the, are worth the stress to find your way to them. Right. Yes. Like, you know, you're finding anything that you can do. This is a classic song. Oh, yeah. And I really just didn't feel like as a non soul band and as a kind of a pickup band, it, we would be able to you know get the delicacies of it. But if we were you know, smarter people, we would have done, if we wanted to do this song, we would have done the talking heads arrangement, not the Al Green arrangement. Uh, for mm. for a variety of reasons. Well, I like uh, the commitments arrangement. Okay, yeah, there you go. Right, yeah, okay, sure. But we didn't. We did the Al Green one, and we we persevered. There was a moment where it was like, should we like early, early on, like at about that week and a half mark, where it was like, yeah, should we pull the plug on this? And it was like, well, it's just a little high for everybody except for Brian's voice, right? It's in the key E, <laughs> that's it. So it kind of hangs around that that high G sharp, and you know. Having heard the early renditions of it, me being particularly guilty, you know, among everybody, that's just a high freaking note for most for yeah. most guys singers, right? Yeah, it is. It is. But we were able to find it. Like everybody hit enough of it that we could, you know, <laughs> cut it together. Like you don't need to hear everybody's rendition all the way through the 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 the, right. the thing. It was like that was that was where Skylar really shined. She was like, nope, nope, okay, yes, that, okay, great, you know. That's and then cool. it was like put it together. And, um, and we made it work. So yeah, I'm stoked. So we both played, we both played this week. I had a rehearsal and a gig. You had a gig. Tell me about your gig, man. Yeah. So my first live gig, I was supposed to have a gig, um, last two Sundays ago, but it got rained out. Actually it didn't get rained out, but they had to make the call on the Friday because whether they were going to, you know, inform people and then it was supposed to rain. And then sure. at the last minute it ended up being a nice day. So, sure. so just my bad karma. But my, so my first gig was actually last Sunday and coincidentally, it's a brand new venue for me down in this new area that I'm living. Um, nice. It was a winery tasting room uh, laid out nice with social distancing good built-in, you know, local crowd that comes out to enjoy a glass of wine on a Sunday afternoon. Um, 
One cool thing is I bought the new Bose sound system. I sold the one that I love to Simon okay. in my band, and he's using it for his solo stuff now. And I bought the new rendition. Um, what little what, less to carry. What is it? What's the model? It's the Bose L116 Pro. Okay. Cool. I'll All put right. it in the show notes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So it's the newest incarnation of this Bose, you know, uh, a line array tower that uh, I've been using for 10 years and it sounds great and it's less to carry. And uh, so it was cool. Um, I, I really felt good. I mean, I was a little nervous actually because I hadn't done it for so long. Sure. But it felt great. I got, I played a lot of music. It was a three hour gig. Um, one interesting thing about this, well, again, my first gig down in this new area uh, tipping is an interesting thing, right? So these solo gigs, the goal is to go about 50, 50 guaranteed pay and tips that, that to me is a good outcome. M mostly if, if I take a gig that's, you know, below my, my rate, yeah. um, it's because I expect it to be a great tipping gig, but this is my first one. I don't really have any experience and, and, People tipped a lot lower, uh, and I was surprised. And so, I haven't had to think about this before about how to how to stimulate tipping. And it got me thinking. It's a good topic for you and I. Like, how often during a show do you talk about tips? I usually say at the you know, like when I maybe maybe when I, when I'm about to take a break or one other time. Hey, if you like what I'm doing, there's a happiness receptacle up here. Sure, you know, <laughs> right? And that's about all that I do. Um, I got a good tip from Simon, a good lesson from Simon. He actually puts a, a sign. He, uh, I think he mostly does tips into his guitar case, but I have like a little, you know, like a, like a jar type yeah. of thing and a, a, a sign with a Venmo QR code. So, you know, a lot sure. of more people can just, scan. um, but I don't know. Do, do you have any ideas? You know, bands typically, especially if we, you know, we're playing a place with a, with a cover charge or a ticket price, you're not taking tips, but in those places where you take a, a freebie gig or, you know, a, a pro bono gig or a, have your reasons and you do want to ask for tips either way, either for the solo duo performers or for bands, do you have any thoughts on what the best practices are for stimulating tipping? Um, well, I think it's, it's important to note that you came from an area that is one of the most affluent areas in the country. Uh, okay. No, no. I, like, I, I think you're, you're going through a, an expectation resetting process, hmm. uh, because to, to get 50, 50 on tips versus a, a guarantee is th that takes, that's a special effort, uh, certainly around here. Uh, and, and you can do it. And I know people that, that do it regularly. Like, like my friend, Matt Langley, he is a human song machine. He, you know, he's the one that remembers everything. He can just play whatever song he's ever heard once on the radio. He can fake his yeah. way through it. And so he, you know, to stimulate tips, he does an, a, you know, a basically all request night. If nobody's requesting anything, he's got a catalog in his head that he can just, you know, rattle off and play as many hours as he needs to. But, but he really focuses on the, the request thing. And that brings in the tips. He does. He's also a, a decent piano player. And again, because of this, this, you know, savant knowledge that he has, he does a dueling pianos gig. Those gigs, I don't even think they get a guarantee. And if they do, it's, it's dwarfed by the tips, but that's the whole dueling pianos concept, right? So I think if your gig is built to be a tipping oriented thing, and that's part and parcel of the interaction with the crowd, then, sure. then you, you will make the tipping thing work. Otherwise, yeah, it, it's a tough, it, it's a tough road to hoe. I, one, one thing to do. And I notice Amanda does this, uh, Amanda Dane, who I uh, have played with a bunch and, and hope to actually looks like we'll be playing a lot more together this summer, uh, which I'm excited about, but she was always really good. She would leave. She had business cards made up that were just basically, you know, cards with a picture of like, I think it was just her on it with, you know, her website where you could get her schedule and, and that sort of thing. But she would put them on a stool or something, a little table next to her tip jar. And so she would always say, you know, oh, you can, you know, if you like the band, you can come up and get a card next to the tip jar. So she wasn't mm. always pushing the tip jar, but she was always smart. mentioning the tip jar. And it was like, I would watch this happen and, and it was like, oh, this is really smart because you're, you're not being, you're, you're giving something away 
but there's the tip jar when someone comes up to get it, right? And so you could sort of do the same thing with maybe stickers, which are pretty cheap to make. Like they're pr probably not all that much more expensive to make than business cards. And now, you know, oh, there's stickers up here. If you want a sticker, come get one there next to the tip jar. And so having that sort of, I mean, it, to treat a business card like a loss leader is a little <laughs> bit disingenuous, but, but, but thinking of it that way, like having something that people can, you know, can, can do, or just a reason to reference the tip jar, you know, would nice. be, would be, I think is a, a great idea because you've got it. You can't just do it a couple times a set. It, it needs to be, you know, every other song kind of thing in order in order for that mind share to yeah, to there's a tip permeate. <laughs> there's, there yeah. is a tip jar, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So two things. So Simon um, uh, put that that Venmo QR code on on some guitar picks. So we went to mm. Picks of Destiny, got a good bulk of picks, and puts them out everywhere. And people grab a pick, and there's a QR code. So that's that's kind of his tactic. But yeah. I like this. Uh, I like you know because the concern is you don't. You don't want to make your gig feel like the guy's begging for tips every other song, but you're like, Hey, I got cards up here next to the, the tip jar. Such a smart, casual way to, you know, cause giving away cards is something a musician would want to do. And that's a, that's a no, you know, a no stress thing right. for the audience. In it. So yep. that makes a lot of sense, but you think every other song is not obtrusive? No, as long as you just, you know, casually mention it, it, it you know, don't, don't take two minutes b between each, you know, every other song, but you know, a, a, a literally five second mention, you know, Oh, thanks so much. I'm, I'm glad you appreciate it. I got cards up here next to the tip jar. Uh, the next tune we're doing is, you know, whatever, you, you know, just keep it, keep it casual, but keep it top of mind. I think that's yeah, I like a, that. That's a big part of it, you know, cause as people are drinking throughout the night, they're going to get more generous. It's simply how it works, especially if you're entertaining them. Um, and you know, and then you can always joke around about, it. I mean, I've, you know, the people that say, Oh, play, you know, sweet home Alabama. Well, that costs 20 bucks, you know, or whatever it is like, you know, and, and you can, you can joke about it. And, and if you can joke about it in a genuine and not entirely awkward way, that can be really helpful. You know, as if everybody, if there is the, if everybody feels like they're in on the joke about the tip jar, then they're more comfortable with the tip jar, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and then there's it, it probably needs not be said, but put a few dollars in the tip jar to start. No, no. Right. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. I know you know that, but just yeah, well, yeah. while we're sharing tip jar one oh one here, like that is, that is literally tip jar one oh one. you know, get, go, go change 10 bucks at the, at the bar for 10 singles and put those 10 singles in that, in that tip jar so that it put looks the 10. Like, yeah. And it, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Put that float that at the top. That's right. Make so I would love to hear, uh, from gig gab listeners. I mean, uh, Mike Mendoza, um, our sax guy, he has, uh, when he does a solo thing, he puts uh, out a sign that says feeling tipsy, you know, so he, you know, he tries to be clever. Yeah. I've seen people put out two jars and just say, um, uh, which fund do you want to donate to? We can tar and feather Ted Cruz or we can, you know, <laughs> like, suggest, you know, they make a kind of a game out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would love to hear what clever things people do. Chocolate so or vanilla tipping. favorite, favorite exactly, ice cream flavor. Yeah. Right. It's a pole or something like that. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. Or which, which song do you want me to end the set with? You know, you want this or this and now, uh, there you go. right. Like anything, love just it. making it part of the show. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Ah, <sighs> All right. Well, so we had our first bitter pill. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Before I do that, you asked everybody to send in their ideas and we neglect. I put it in the show notes to email feedback at giggabpodcast.com, but we didn't say to email feedback at giggabpodcast.com. So please, if you have any thoughts to answer Paul's question, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and sorry about the oversight. So yeah, we had our first, but I'm excited. We had our first bitter pill rehearsal uh, on Sunday. Yes, Sunday. Indoors, outdoors, outdoors. Um, about uh, depending on how you kind of cut, cut, cut the mustard, half of us in the band are vaccinated, and half of us are not yet vaccinated. And so it was. Um, so we, we all kept our distance from one another. We were about, you know, six feet apart outside. Um, we all, we all know what each other's up to. And, and there was, you know, the trust conversation, there was not the testing, uh, that would normally have happened, especially if we were indoors or anything like that. I mean, some of us are tested 
regularly. Some of us are not, um, right. but you know, but we, we all felt okay with, with it and it was fantastic. Um, it, really nice to get together. It was, it was actually really fun. One moment we, we were spending a lot of time working on new songs. We actually have a, a, a show that we are going to be putting on next spring, spring of 2022, a, a theatrical performance, uh, and I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to share about it. So I'm not going to, I think I could probably share just about everything, but, um, but I, I will, I will hold back. Oh, no, I think it's, I think it's out there. It's, um, it's a, a, a children's show, but, but a very, very dark <laughs> children's show. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but it'll be the band and, and, you know, a handful of, of actors, both children and, and not children. Uh, but so we were working on some new songs that some of them were, you know, sort of geared towards that. And some of them were just new songs that, you know, Emily or Billy, uh, I think it was just Emily and Billy who had brought songs, but we, you know, certainly the, the two of them. And, uh, and so we're just working on new songs and, and which is great. I mean, it like that whole process of having somebody bring a song in, you know, you sort of stumble through it. You feel your way. You start singing a little bit of harmonies, you know, to try and find what would work, what's not going to work, experimenting with it. Like just, you know, that not, not to call it a blank slate because certainly somebody's coming in with, with a fairly well formed, you know, structure for a song, but, but just, you know, that, that freedom where it has not yet been arranged uh, and, and just being able to kind of play with it and, and try different ideas. So we're doing a lot of that. And it's so much fun. I really love that part of being in an original band. And, uh, and so we were doing a lot of that and our guitar player, John was supposed to have been away this weekend. I did not realize his trip was canceled, but he had a bunch of work stuff. Um, he's a realtor. And so weekends tend to be busy when he's, you know, when he's around and he, um, he showed up and he's like, I only have, you know, I can only be here for a few minutes. I can't really play, but I just wanted to say, Hey, and you know, so he did, he checked in and he said, Hey, and, and we had, um, a friend of the band, a very close friend of the band, um, this guy, Todd Hunter, who is a filmmaker, uh, as well as simply being a friend. And he's documenting this whole thing, uh, the, the process of creating this theatrical performance that will be next spring. And since this really was our first rehearsal, since we knew that this was happening, he came and he was filming. And I think the film will be very cool uh, in the end, but, but he captured some really nice moments. There's a moment of us sort of, you know, stumbling through one of Emily's songs. And then, uh, you know, John was like, ah, I can't really stay. And, and, I think it was Todd, but it was someone who said, but you could play one song with us. And he was like, Oh yeah, I could. He got super excited. He grabbed a guitar off the ground or whatever it was. And we tried to decide, you know, we we're trying to decide what should we play? I was like, well, let's play this song, whiskey, oxy and a couple of perks, which is the, um, it's actually a song that was originally in that show, the Breck tones that I did with Billy. And it's the one that as bitter pill, we often open shows with. So we're, we're pretty used to playing it fairly cold. And, uh, Man, it took us about halfway through the first verse, and then it was just like everything locked in, and it was like, "Oh, right, yep, we can do this." Okay, good, great. Well, you know, I, I was telling you last week that we're getting ready to have a conversation, a band meeting about ready to go in. I, I'm guessing that um, muscle memory will be seventy-five to eighty yeah. percent for a lot of this stuff, yeah. right? And um, I just, my biggest thing has been is the vibe going to be there. And, you know, people have shared, you know, you guys are going to be so happy to just, just yep. be back together. That will carry even, you know, smudge over any mistakes that people are going to make that that's, you know, the first reaction you're going to have the scrutiny of the specifics of the playing and, the, and all that type of stuff is something you're not going to get back to, you know, you're going to just gonna be so happy to be making music and having it sound somewhat like where you left it when you, when you, uh, when this all started. Yeah. Yeah. And we, that definitely was this, I mean, this was a very low pressure scenario. It, it, you know, Billy, we did it at Billy's house in his backyard and he said, it's going to be a nice day on uh you know, Saturday or Sunday. Uh, how it, no pressure. Anybody is interested and feels comfortable with it is welcome. You know, who, who would be into it and what day works, you, you know? And so it, it, it quickly became like Sunday would be the only day that, that kind of, you know, mutually had any, any possibility of working for a majority of us. And, and it was like, okay, cool, but everybody's welcome, but nobody's expected. It's not like, you know, you're thrown out of the band or something. If you don't show up, it was very much just, this is, we're just going to hang out in the yard with our instruments is really what it kind of came down to. And, mm -hmm. um, 
in the end, at least for a, a relatively short period of time, we had the entire band there, which was not the expectation at all. Right. Yep. So, it, you know, that kind of low stakes thing, especially for a first one, was a really nice way to do this for us all to feel comfortable with saying, you know what, last minute, I'm not OK with this. Like, I, I don't you know, we're all we all need to heal from this this experience of, of being isolated and, you know, the, the, whatever fear or whatever factors contributed to all of that, we need yeah. to heal from this and we're all going to do it in different ways and at different speeds. And, you know, even my wife and I, who obviously have been together through this whole thing, as we're sort of moving and, you know, thinking that maybe that, you know, glimmer on the horizon is actually the light at the end of the tunnel, even, you know, between us, it's like, okay, well, would you be comfortable doing this now? Or, or you be comfortable? And it's, we are, we are on very different pages we're finding. And it's not, it's not a source of conflict. It's just like, it's, it's something we've noticed as interesting. Like, wow, yeah. it, this is fascinating that, you know, you'd be comfortable doing that. And I definitely wouldn't, but I'd be comfortable doing this and you definitely wouldn't. And that's okay. Yes. It, we yeah, just we're having that in our family as well. Yeah. I mean, my, my oldest daughter who has moved out here, she yeah. is like, nope. And if you guys are going to go do stuff, you got to get tested before we can get together. And, you know, yeah. so she's, she's like, we are, we let's not fool ourselves. We're, right. we're 70% of the way to the finish line, but we're not at the finish line yet. Correct. So, yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, it's just fascinating. And so I, I think for people that are in the scenario, you know, we had this, I mean, to say it was unintentional is, is probably wrong. We're, we're a pretty um, outspoken or an outspoken band in general, especially, you know, Billy, um, but which is great by the way. Uh, but you know, in, we're a very communicative, we are an over communicative band. We really like to just talk about lots of different things. And so it, like, that's, almost certainly why the, when Billy called this rehearsal, it was very clearly like no pressure. Like he understood, he understood what was going to happen. Uh, but I would, I would share that that w might be a good way for your band. And I don't just mean you, Paul, I mean, everybody to, you know, try that and just say, okay, like low stakes, let's see how it is when we get together. Because if there's no pressure, some people might think, you know, okay, I would, I would have, if it was, if I had to make the call, you know, when somebody asked, I would have said no. But as the more I've thought about it, like, well, you know what? I might show up for 20 minutes, but I might be over there a little bit and just see how it is. And and you, you got to, you know, we all have to decide what's comfortable. And that's, Absolutely. that's okay. Yeah. I, um, I played last Wednesday night, I played a youth cabaret at, um, at uh, the theater where I, I played, you know, a bunch of different things. The, my friend Julius, who I hadn't played with in probably a year and a half, uh, called me and he said, you know, I've been uh, a counselor at this youth camp that's been doing, you know, this theater camp that's kind of doing this thing. And we're putting together a cabaret, a rock and roll cabaret. He's like, I, you know, we were just going to do it with with piano and and them. He's like, but if I can have a band, like that'd be really cool for the kids. And I, I was available. I did not realize that it was the same week as South by Southwest. If I did, I would have said no. And I'm really glad I didn't. It made for a crazy week. And I, I want to talk a little bit about what I saw at, uh, at South. I mean, I attended South by Southwest remotely, obviously, or perhaps not obviously, but that's what I did because that's how it was this year. There was no on site. Uh, and so it made things a little bit nuts, but, uh, but I'm glad I did it. So uh, you know, I kept emailing him. I'm like, Hey man, what, uh, you know, what are the songs that we need to learn for this? And the gig is, was Wednesday night and rehearsal was Tuesday night and Monday at about 11 AM. I got the list of songs and, uh, I was like, okay, well, I know maybe, you know, a third of these and the rest of these I need to learn before rehearsal. And so, you know, we did our thing and we got together and, um, and it was fine. And there were a couple of songs at rehearsal. We had you know, there were some songs that the band wasn't playing on and then the rest of them, the band was, and there were two songs that were miscategorized that, that it was like not banned. And then during rehearsal, we realized, Oh no, it is banned. So he sort of coached us through those. And one of them, for whatever reason, got a lot more of our mind share than the other. And by the end of rehearsal, we had forgotten that there were two songs that were miscategorized. We were really focused on one. So as we were leaving, he's like, don't forget, make sure you listen to that tune. And I'm like, yep, yep. I'll, I got it. You know, I'll chart it. I'll show up. No problem. So 
we get to the gig Wednesday night, uh, full house, of course, because people are coming to see their kids at full socially distanced house. Uh, the theater would normally hold about 250 people. I'll say there were 71 people or something in there. So, you know, socially distanced, but it was super nice to have like a, a extremely appreciative crowd to play for it. It'd been a long time, probably since that bitter pill gig you know, that we did outside in, in September. Mm -hmm. So that part was, I mean, I know they weren't, I mean, they were appreciative of us as the band being there to back up their kids, but obviously they were there, you know, to, to see their kids, which is great. And, uh, and so we, you know, we get through the first set of the gig and then um, it was interesting backstage. We were talking about something and different ways to approach songs. And somebody said, well, some songs you can just like play live, like you're a live band and other songs you have to really like think like you're in the studio. And I said, yeah, you know, Kelly Clarkson tunes are that latter thing for me. I, I always feel like whenever I play Clarkson's tunes, I got to like, I got to think like I'm in the studio and everybody was like, yeah, something in the back of my head is like Kelly Clarkson. Why, why should I be worried about that? Ah, whatever. Like, you know, it's fine. And so we go out on stage for the, the second set and, um, you know, we're, I don't know, about three or four songs in. And I look and I'm like, oh, there's, that's right. There's a Kelly Clarkson tune. I'm like, I don't have that charted. So I lean over to Julius. And I'm like, hey, man, like you just play that song alone, right? He's like, no, no, no. That's like <laughs> full on rock. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, crap. And I'm like, yeah. And he says, okay. Versus closed hi-hat. Choruses open hi-hat. And I'm like, Okay. I said, <laughs> Here we go. I said, wait, is there a break right before each chorus? He's like, yep. And I'm like, I'm on you like glue. And so, <laughs> and then it was like, and then we counted the song in. Like it was just, and, and it went fine. You know, it was great. I mean, he and I've played together a bunch. We trust each other. He also is a, a drummer at some level, which means he knows how to talk to like efficiently communicate you know, the way you would think about drums. Yeah. Yeah. Really helpful, especially, you know, in that panicked 25 seconds we had, but, That's um, funny. but yeah, it went fine. It was great. And we had some really nice moments. Our, our bass player, Miles, man, such a monster. And we wound up playing, I wish the Stevie wonder tune. And it was like butter. I mean, I could have stayed in that groove <laughs> all night. It was so good. Fun. So it was fun. I miss it. I miss it so much. Right. Yeah. That was it. Is it's like I I I missed it. Yeah. Exactly. So our, our, I a couple of weeks ago I sat in that when I had that gig rained out. Yeah. I was in town, and Simon invited me to sit in with him. And Russ has been doing kind of cajon. Yeah. You know, yeah. Really stripped down small kid. Yeah. And and then another friend of ours who was a bass player was there and, and sat in and, and it was like, oh my gosh, I'm hearing all these sounds that I haven't yeah. heard to the left of me and to the right of me in a long time. So we were playing acoustic guitar, so we weren't really digging in that much. But sure. It was nice to feel a groove. Yes. Just to feel yes. music, you know, shaping the atmosphere was just awesome. Yeah, it's good to feel it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, hey, hey I got a story. OK. All right. I, I, I want to make sure I, I talk a little bit about some of these South by Southwest sessions, uh, but I'll save the movies for next week, folks. So uh, do, do you want to do your stuff first? Or you want to. Yeah, talk sure. About the yeah, yeah. No, I, I think these are these are the, the little lessons that I learned. I So I attended, as I said, I attended South by Southwest last week and the it, there's three parts of South by Southwest that that exist for me when I or are a focus for me. One are, you know, seeing bands play. They did some of that with live streaming. To be perfectly honest, it wasn't it, it was it was tough to really get into it. These bands were not they didn't set the bands up in any way to be able to be interactive with people. And I really they were just playing through their sets, um, you know, in whatever their 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 garage or their house or a studio somewhere or whatever it was. I mean, they all looked fine, but without the interactivity, it was tough. I, I uh, so anyway, I watched a couple of bands, but it, it's really unfair to to even talk about them by name because it it just it's not it's not how they would normally be. But the the um, the two other things are, as I said, movies, uh, especially movies about music and musicians. And so I have three of those to talk about next week. And then the third is sessions where, you know, you go and you you see people speak. And so there were three sessions. There were many sessions I attended from my desk, which is an awful place to attend a session because you got your email right there. And, you know, you can sort of lose sight on things. But um, there was there was one 
that was uh, a panel of people. And the name of the session was, we, we want live shows again, at concerts in a post COVID world. And there was a woman named Michelle Cable, who is a, um, a, an agent, uh, a manager, and she manages a bunch of Australian bands. And so they are already doing this, right? But they are in a post COVID world down there. And she said, it's fascinating. They do contact tracing at the venue. Um, mm. Every venue has to pay for a COVID marshal, someone that will oversee the COVID protections and tracing and any restrictions that need to happen. It is like they are the point person. They are responsible for making sure this happens. Um, the band and crew, every band and crew that that comes and plays needs to have COVID safety training and the, the team, the band's team, whatever that comprise, uh, comprises of uh, or is comprised of, needs to provide a COVID safety plan before the show can happen, uh, which is really, I mean, it, it's a very comprehensive thing that they've put together. Uh, yeah. You know, with the, the, everybody is coordinated on this. Uh, it, you know, some of the, the speculation, of course, was that that doing that on a national or maybe even state level in the U S you know, codifying that will be tough, but probably up to artists and venues uh, and of course, their patrons to decide what they're comfortable with and and how that's going to work. I think as things things that go forward. That is so interesting. Yeah, again, yeah. You know, we, we're not on the same page about so much of this stuff, right? Here, here in this country, and so it's, it'll be hard. But when you hear something like that, you know, uh, my wife's best friend lives in Melbourne, Australia, mm. and I think they had like fifteen cases, and they shut stuff down. I mean, oh yeah, they, they you know, and you're like you're like well you know, are they smarter than us? Are they, are they less civil liberties, you know, than us, you know, what is the deal and what right. is the right path? You know, I, you know we're, we don't want to politicize the conversation, but I mean, I think clearly other places um, have, have a, have a different perspective of how to, you know, or, or maybe it's, a, maybe it's a different type of unity that, that their cultures have and, you know, that there's trust, more trust in government or whatever it may be, but you well, wonder, I mean, I, hear that. I mean, like I have a friend who's in, in New Zealand. Uh, he actually was able to move to New Zealand during pandemic uh, from the U S here. He has uh, some, some level of official residency. So he was able to to do that back in December. Yeah. And, and he said, obviously, you know, and, and when he got there, he quarantined in a hotel for 14 days and said, you know, it was like, I mean, it was a nice prison, but it was very much like you will not, you know, you get to go to the yard for an hour a day and shiv each other. And, you know, that's kind of thing. But, um, but, you know, after the 14 days, he was just released into this already sort of bubbled society, right? COVID free society. And, and he said a lot of the same things, contact tracing everywhere you go, including like farmer's markets and no masks because they're unnecessary at this point or at that point there. I, I assume it's remained the same. But um, but he after he'd been there for a couple of weeks, he said, you know, I, I got to say that, yes, things are, are, you know, oddly, weirdly normal here. But he says, I really attribute a lot of it to luck. Um, he said, we just here wound up with a scenario that it was like, oh, wait, it's not here. We can, we can control this. And after it was sort of, we learned, they, they knew they could control it, but it was after we had learned all the things that we needed to learn about it or enough of mm -hmm. the things he's like, so it, it, yes, we have a different style of governing here. Yes. We have some different thought processes. He says, but, but do not discount luck as a huge factor in this. Um, so I, and, but well, I hear are, about luck, but I also hear about shut. Yep. Yeah, I, right. But I also hear about shutdowns after 15 cases. Correct. Right? I mean, so, correct. Yeah. So, well, they're uh, very proud of it now, right? They're very proud of like, this is, you know, to your point, this is now a national, uh, you know, a, a source of national pride that, that we, we can control this, watch us yeah. do it. Right. So they're all in it together. Uh, but I, it didn't, I, I don't think it started that way. I, like, I think it was luck and now they're all in it together is, is that yeah. was his perspective on it. So anyway, you know, and, and again, if we try to be smart and really try and take the view from 10,000 feet, you, they, people make the argument that part of why so much innovation happens in the United States is that we have this constant contention of different ideas. And, yeah. you know, so, so, you know, the, the, in one optic into understanding the dealing with this problem is, 
this is the American culture, right? Yeah. The, the and we're, and we're kicking is, butt with the vaccines, right? Because of that same that, culture. There's, yeah. There's tension built into it that we all get a benefit from, even though we don't enjoy the tension. That's right. Good things do come from that. Yeah. But the flip side of it is when you hear about a country just, just, you know, that is able to, and again, I don't know when Australia shut down, I'm imagining there were people who were like, this sucks, you know, I don't want to do it or I'm not going to do would, it. I, I mean, would bet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, well, that's yeah. a cool. No, it was, it was, it was interesting to, to hear about the logistics. Yeah. And then there was one about fan and band interaction in live stream and it was imaging heap. Uh, but it was primarily the focus of the session. There was Ty Roberts from fan tracks there as well. And she was talking about how she actually feels more free with live streaming because of that personal connection that you can have. Again, you've got to, you've got to be willing to put your part into that, but she's found it excellent because she's able to release things in a less finished state, trialing work for her fans, like sharing early cuts of things, hearing their feedback, actually letting them be part of this process. And I thought that was a really interesting thing. You know, I was, I, you know, watching it, knowing that we were getting this Macworld all-star band, you know, video out there and obviously a very different thing. She's a songwriter. We were just playing a cover tune, but, but, you know, we could have shared snippets of this throughout the process. We, we didn't, we didn't even talk about it. It wasn't even a conscious decision, but it, it made me think like, oh, this is interesting. And now, you know, what we're doing with like the, the bitter pill stuff and sharing these videos that of these very unfinished songs, you know, I mean, it's just us in a yard playing things, but like our, the bitter pill fans have been eating it up and it's like, oh, look at that. That's very interesting. <laughs> like, of course yeah, they're so eating it up. Yeah. It's just interesting. Yeah. Frame it this way. So Simon, you know, from my band, who's now doing a lot of acoustic work. Yeah. He uh, was, I mean, this is almost akin to what they used to call live casting, life casting, yes, right? Yes, life casting. So yeah. Simon, you know, would, would do two shows a week. He would do a show in the middle of the week where yeah. he was, I'm going to try out some new material. Tell me what you think. And, you know, it was like life casting. It was more a conversation that he happened to be playing some music. I, you know, he, Here's an interesting thing. Is music good for that? Or 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 if you're gonna put a lot of work into, you know, like like I would have been in a bad way if we would have shared an early version of that take me to the river. Right. I would have been like, oh, this doesn't represent me very well. You know, I, I'm sure. not sure. Well, that's not, the point. Right? It's 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 not it, it's not a polished representation of us. But should music be? I mean, I mean, is is that kind of you know, this is not that far from the conversation about should you have an iPad on stage? Like, is the is the professional presentation of music something that needs to be taken serious at all times? And you don't lower the bar because if you lower the bar the people who don't charge money for it can kind of you know, step right into that. What is the difference then? I mean, it, 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 can you see all the different shades of gray? Like, you know, I, I can, I guess I zoom out on it and I say, you, you know, the point of this is to entertain and engage people. And if, if that works to entertain and engage, I mean, it's take it this way, right? When, you know, you're in the middle of a gig and somebody requests a song that you don't know, but the vibe in the room is a very, you know, trusting vibe. It, you know, you've got that rapport with the crowd going. And so you try it, right? And everybody in the room is totally into it because it's something that you don't like that they all they're in on the joke, right? It, it, and and to use the word joke is probably wrong, but they're in it, they are it, you are in it together and you're trying this thing that they one or more of them, you know, asked you to do. So like they you have buy-in. Um if, but we've also said, like, if somebody walks into the club in that moment and has no idea what's going on, then that, like, yep, what do they think moment. about? What do they think <laughs> about your band? Well, with a live stream or or not even streaming, but sharing these snippets, you know, I mean, there's two different ways of doing it, and and, and they're they're all fine, but sharing these moments, you can you can control the message. You can be like, hey, just like we did with Bitter Pill, like, look, it's clearly us. We're not at a gig. This is a brand new song, you know, like one guy or even the song that's not brand new, the one that we've played a bunch, uh, you know, I mean, there's John like literally like kneeling on the ground, holding this guitar and just playing. And and it's like, OK, wait a minute. Like these guys are dig this. Now I get to see behind the curtain a little bit. This is for your fans. And All the right, cool so I'm going to blow your mind right now. Yeah. So here's the thing. 
it goes down to the very fundamental question of art just because you can do something should you do something and so you know this is a question of um um is it better to like, like we live in a reality tv yeah. society yeah, right exactly is that good for us you know even though we can see what people do in their private minutes and you know all those types of things and the voyeuristic tendencies that human beings have we of course you're going to get positive feedback of that right but it, is the net net of that if everybody is putting out half-baked music have you lowered the bar of the art so far that it now it's kind of like eh, you know it depends on what you again i think it, it so here's the answer there is no universal answer for this you have to decide is this right for you and what i'm hearing and I could have, I mean, I, I, you and I know each other very well. So, I, I mean, I, I could have predicted where this would have gone. I, I would say for you, it's the wrong thing. You like, you are most comfortable when you are presenting extremely finished, polished product, right? But, th and that's great. And the people that are your fans expect that of you. Now, I also, th I think your fans would also like to see the process, but you, that's not, that's not how you do it. And so that's not how you do it. And that's okay. But for a band like bitter pill, it absolutely makes sense that the, that, you know, to show the fans this little snippet of like, yeah, look, here's what, here's what we can do. And we are all comfortable showing that. It, and it's okay. Yeah. Like it, there is no universal right or wrong thing to, to go with here. You have to go with, what what is your art? And if for you art is final finished product, then that's your art. With bitter pill, it's like that's part of that's one aspect of our art, but the other is the creation of it and what yeah. happens in the moment. And so we'll share that too. So my reflection on that is, um, you guys are good, and so your unfinished art is going to be interesting and useful. I, I like I to think up. so. <laughs> yes. Some, some may disagree. <laughs> yeah. But the problem is, uh, the problem that I feel is in, in music, as we, you know, especially for musicians, as we yeah. try to say that there's a line, um, someone who's not good, who shares unfinished stuff, just because he wants his neighbors to see him, it all gets mixed in together. And that's one of the hard parts for professional and semi-professional musicians is, is the art uh, does it need to be, you know, we're saying it, we're always trying to to delineate between the pr the pro and the and the amateur is just a constant struggle of 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 musicians. And I'm not saying that there's not room for the amateur, but I'm just saying that, you know, once the bar is lowered to accommodate this kind of voyeuristic reality TV mentality that we have, you could say, Hey, that's where the world is right now. I, and I get that. Yes. That's where the world is right now. A lot of people love the Kardashians, sure. right? I mean, that's where the world is. They want to see behind the scenes stuff. But the question I would just keep asking is, is, you know, is it really what's best for the craft? And so just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Yeah, I, I guess so. I, I mean, we are learning more about human interaction, uh, and, and social media has taught us a lot of that as a podcaster. I learned a lot of, you know, I'm teaching this UNH class, the business of podcasting. And we were, you know, we were talking about, we've picked our, our topic for, for the, the season and it's travel. And it, you know, the class sort of picked this and one, as we were picking topics, one person was like, well, wait a minute, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of experience traveling. I know where I'd like to go. But that doesn't like that doesn't give me an, like a, a, like what what justification do I have to to go and be a podcaster telling people about travel? And I had to stop him and say, OK, well, that's a great question. However, you don't in order to engage with an audience, you don't want to be so far above them that you're unrelatable. I said what you just shared with me is super relatable to literally every person on this campus, right? You know, like there might, maybe not every person, there's probably a few people that do have money and, and have traveled all over, but a lot of people are really interested in exactly that viewpoint. And, mm. you know, you don't want to put yourself necessarily, you, you know, you know, eight steps above them on the ladder of life, maybe just like a half step or one step above <laughs> them is, but that makes you relatable. And I've definitely learned this doing, you know, this show and Mac geek Cab over the years is like, 
you know, you start to realize everybody, we're all kind of the same. I think it's one of the things I like about the band Fish. I mean, they're great musicians, but they are, they are people who have fun playing music. They are willing to show that they experiment with things and fail sometimes, right? Like all bands do that. They're willing to do it on stage. They yeah. understand they're entertaining a crowd. So they, they, they have some limits built in to what they will do, whether it seems like that or not, they definitely do. Uh, you know, they, 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 they know that, okay, well for two and a half hours, we've actually got to like put on a show that people aren't going to say this sucked. And, and so they, you know, they, they craft things in a way, but they also give themselves moments where they can just sort of try stuff and be silly and fun. And that's a big part of what I like about that. And so, but it's not for everybody, you, you know, it, and so the idea is, well, okay, like for, for you and with your stuff and with the house rockers and your solo stuff, like polished product, there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't think that it's universally wrong to, to show behind the scenes, especially like Imogene Heap was saying for people who are already your fans, you know, opening the live stream up and you can control this, right? You can say, okay, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to share some early works of my stuff, but only with people that are, you know, uh, contributing to my Patreon, right? So yeah. now, now you've got a, now there really is a barrier to entry and you're not just showing this to the general public. You truly are only showing it to people that have an expressed interest in you. So, and I don't know that that's what she's doing, but that is a way of, of delineating like this is, this is the in progress, unfinished, rough stuff. And here's the, 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 you know, the, the polished stuff and, and you can have both, but you got to express interest in having both. It's not just going to be out there as an equal. Maybe that's a way to do it. I don't know. You know Fair enough. I don't know. Um, one last thought was from Willie Nelson, who did a session with, uh, with Andy Langer, who's a, a longtime music reporter. Um, we have had the conver and there were many things that Willie said. In fact, he talked a lot about the energy exchange between him and the fans and the way he approached it was, you know, I'm glad to be there. I think they're glad to be there. It's a win-win situation. <laughs> it, was a, it was an interesting, very simple, but, but very profound way of looking at it. But um, Andy asked him about politics and Willie had a really interesting approach. Now, obviously if you were to ask Willie about his politics or, um, or, or encounter him in an activist scenario or environment, it's Willie holds nothing back. Like it's very easy to tell what Willie Nelson's politics are. If you want to know what Willie Nelson's politics are, but he says when he's on stage, he doesn't include politics in his show. He says, whatever people want to be is cool with me. You know, I'm here on stage. I'm me. My band is my band. My, my crowd is my crowd and it's okay. Like we're here for the music. Like he said, he's glad to be there. He assumes the crowd's glad to be there. Otherwise they wouldn't, but he yeah. doesn't preach from the stage. And I, 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 I very much appreciated that level of wisdom from, from him. I, it, I did not, it, it took me by surprise, but it, it clearly is something that he has crafted over his life and his career. But it, I thought it was a very, it, it really resonated with me. I realize there's some people that, you know, feel very differently about bringing politics to the stage. But, but, um, but I thought that was interesting about Willie because he's, you know, yeah, obviously a very politically it. active person, but, yeah. but not in the show. I wonder if it'll change. I mean, I, I would say that um, I don't have a problem with it. The artists that I like, I tend to like the artists where, you know, I see their songs as optics into their amazing minds. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if their mind is, you know, has politics on it, you know, that's part of what I'm buying into when I like an artist. And, if, and there, I can't think of any artists whose politics I am polar opposite with, but I still enjoy their art. I'd have to think about that, but um, well, you may, you, it may, ha it may be true, but you don't know it if they aren't yeah. infusing their politics into their art. Right. I guess my point is, it, 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 the when the artists that I uh, like bring politics on stage, it doesn't turn me off. But I am keenly aware that it turns a lot of people, you know, very far off. I, I, I don't. I don't if, even like it. I, I personally, I I find no place for it. And if I'm going to see a band, I don't. I don't even like it if they agree with me. Now I say that fully aware 
that literally every bitter pill show is fronted by Billy and Emily Butler, and they are very happy to talk about their politics on stage. They talk about their politics everywhere. It's not it's not like it's only on stage, but it definitely comes out. It's not usually it's not the uh, the dominant message of the show. Um, but it's all, it is the message of the show. I mean, the music politics are infused into, into Billy and, and Emily's music in a huge way. Like you, you can't yeah. extract them. So, and I'm fine well, with I'll that. Just, yeah, the crowd's okay with it. I'm fine with it. Like, you know, yeah. I, I would just close with two things. One is I wonder if it's going to change, you know, given what the country has been through and the amount of terseness, I wonder if artists, um, are going to back off a little bit, you know, yeah. pro level artists yeah, yeah. are going to back off and you know, it's not, it doesn't need to happen. Maybe, maybe could the go other, the other way. The other but, thought yep. is, I, like I've never seen Billy, but I've also never seen an amateur, you know, a, a weekend warrior band that tries to politicize or take a, you know, promote a, their, their social stands, have it come off. Well, I've never, you know, you, you just don't have the gravitas. You just don't have the buy-in from the audience that your opinion matters that much. So, you know, for the people listening to this, I don't, you know, you may say it because you feel it's part of your art. I guess, you know, that that's up to you. I will just say I've never seen it happen successfully where, you know, I, I, I've you know, like, I've heard that, like, we all need to be good to each other. Everybody sure. loves each other. You know, that type of stuff goes over well. Sure. But, you know, when you hear, you know, F in Guantanamo Bay, I've never heard a, a, a weekend warrior band, semi-pro band, try and take a political stance on something and have it work. You yeah, never, it, you know, it works for Billy, he, but you have to understand you know. Billy is it, to call him an amateur is absolutely the wrong word. He is a world-class professional actor. There you go. In addition to being a world-class professional musician and world-class professional songwriter. So, like, be, so be that before you do that. Right. right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You got to be good at, you have to be good sell at your, delivering. Sell your, sell your position effectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he like, not only is he world-class, but he's also well-trained, uh, in, in most of these things. So Got it. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not, it's not an accident, nor is it a surprise that he is usually able to very effectively engage a crowd on hot button topics. Um, He's really good at it. In fact, it's, yeah, a, yeah it's every show is a masterclass. It's, it's sort of, it's cool. I, I guess maybe that's why I like it because he's so good at it. I think, you know, if it were, if it were just, if, if, if it were fling, no offense to the guys in fling, but if any of them started preaching about politics, I, like, I, I can't imagine that it would end <laughs> in anything other than utter disaster. And I, again, I don't, I say that, you know, to, to support your point, like most of us are just bad at this. And if you, if you, if you disagree, take a look at Facebook every now and then, and, and maybe you'll change your mind. <laughs> so, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Good point. Did well, you have, I cut you off. Do you want to, do, do you want to save that for next episode or do you have a thing you want to share for this episode? No, I think I got enough to say about this other thing. We should put it off to the next episode. Great. So let's hold it on. But um, I do have one other thing I want to share. So, um, you know, my drummer is Russ. You've met Russ. Great yeah. guy. Russ was in a band for 50 years called Sage that was legendary here in the Bay Area. I mean, they were, you know, one of the first horn bands, you know. Sure. You know, back in the day when you could be a cover band, there was a traveling circuit and, and, uh, and uh, you know, Russ was a professional musician on that circuit. So Sage, amazing legendary band founded by Russ and his brother Frank. Uh, they had a, a wonderful lead singer. He, he was in the band two or three times over the course of the 50 years. His name was Lou Solis, and Lou passed away recently. Mm. And so I just want to take a moment. Uh, rest in peace, Lou. Uh, condolences to his friends and fans and family. And uh, just going to think about Lou a little bit this week. Uh, Great musician. I'm sorry to hear that. And yeah, much love to to everybody that that knew and loved Lou. Lou. That's, um, that's excellent. I want to make sure I get the spelling of his name right for you. Would you mind spelling that so we have it right? I'll get it. Okay. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that. And again, condolences. Uh, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, a fun episode. Uh, very, we went all over the place this, uh, this week. <laughs> it's good. And we have lots of places to go going forward too. Uh, I want to talk about the, the three movies that I'm going to talk about next time are the Demi Lovato dancing with the devil movie, Tom Petty, summer, you feel free. And of course, the under under the volcano movie about um, about the Air Studios Montserrat, which was really fantastic. But we'll we'll share all that kind of going on. So, right, do you have anything good. else, man? Are we good? Just, I would just say always be performing. Other than that, we're good. I like it. That's a good thing, man. Yeah. 
Have a good week, folks. We'll see you next time.